Hello, this is Dr. Daniel Kohinka. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, and in this video, I'm going to discuss the psychology of leadership. I believe one of the most important things that individuals need to understand is that anyone can be a leader. This is very important because leadership is greatly needed in any society, in any family, community, and if people believe that they only you know, can be a leader if they have a title, maybe as a, as a manager or as a, a president of a company or the director of an organization or, or what have you, <clears throat> uh, they may be limited in their willingness of, of con contributing to their communities or their organizations. However, when people understand that they can be a leader and they do not have to have any sort of title, then people are more likely to step forward and conduct themselves as a leader. Well, what does that mean? Well, conducting yourself as a leader means that first off, you see yourself as a leader and being able to improve organizations or communities. And again, communities could be the family, could be uh, uh, within your local area that you live, uh, could be a, a racial community that you're very active in because of, of your ethnicity. So a variety of definitions of communities, and you can be a leader in any of those, no matter who you are. We will talk more about this later on, particularly as we begin to look at servant leadership. Other leadership styles, I would argue that some of them, uh, some individuals perhaps uh, could be leaders, but maybe they need a title. Uh, so we're not going to that in that in in we're going to discuss that in great depth shortly. First, let's look at a couple concepts that I consistently will stress whenever I talk about leadership, and that is uh, one concept is power versus influence. It is very important to understand that uh, power is something that one might argue you can exhibit if you're a leader. However, power has many limitations compared to influence. So as a leader, if you want to exhibit power, the way that looks is perhaps you, you use your title, if you have one, to tell people what to do, to delegate, to, uh, with large governments, for instance, or, or nations, to, to use your power to dramatically change a culture. Okay, so that, that is, that is using power or again telling individuals this is what you must do arguably and i would argue that that is not necessarily leadership but simply a use of power based on title uh, use of authority leadership however is about influence it's about letting individuals make up their own minds their own decisions be able to think critically themselves and I, in, uh, in various ways, be able to, as a leader, influence them so that way, whatever your goals are, whatever your community's goals, whatever it is in the best interest of that community organization um, um, becomes real. It becomes, it, it gets addressed. Individuals that are influenced will have the opportunity to do the right thing themselves rather than being told what to do. This is, a, again, a very important concept, particularly within the workplace, where you do have managers. So within the workplace, you have managers, and there is a difference, again, between manager and leader. Similarly, like power, a manager is, is someone who gets tasks completed. They tell people what to do. They say, here is the jobs that need to be done today, and you need to do this, you need to do that, and so on. So delegating. Managers are also, and they're a critical part of any organization, managers also manage budgets. They understand how much money uh, they have to complete a task. They understand the workload. They understand the amount of time that must be uh, taken in order to get a job done. All of those, the, all, of, all of that type of uh, a work, which is perhaps you could also consider more short-term, more numbers based is, is manager related activities versus a leader is perhaps more uh, inclined to be responsible for vision, whether it be within their departments or the, the larger organization.
They're more responsible for engaging workers so workers can feel good about themselves. And then in turn, the business does well because the workers are engaged in the workplace. A leader will recognize that communication is critical to an effective organization. And by having open communication, by making workers feel like they can come forward and discuss problems or ideas, then research has shown that by doing so, organizations will be more creative, more innovative, uh, many, many different benefits associated with those characteristics that a leader exhibits versus a manager. I guess, per se, uh, I guess, for example, what I've showed in um, uh, other presentations is that a good combination of being a manager, if you have a title, or if you don't have a title, one can still manage. You can manage your own time, for instance, or help others manage their time. So a combination of being a good manager as well as a good leader is somewhat of the ideal. Because if you lack in an organization one or the other, then various problems will arise. Here's some more examples of differences between what you might call a manager or in some people would call the boss uh, versus a leader. So a boss, again, they'll drive employees and you'll notice not necessarily uh, motivate employees, but drives employees. Uh, they uh, depend on authority. So in other words, the, the manager, the, the boss needs to be told what to do, but the boss also uses their authority over others. Uh, they inspire or could inspire fear. You can have good managers, you can have good bosses, but many times to some degree, they may inspire fear. So in other words, even if it's nothing um, very blatant, in other words, nothing very obvious, workers may still fear for losing their job, fear for um, not getting a promotion or not making, uh, getting a pay raise or a bonus. Oftentimes the boss will be like uh, referring to themselves, I. I need you to do this, I need you to do that. They may place blame uh, for the break breakdown. So in other words, a manager uh, may not say, you know, it was my fault. That's more of a leadership characteristic, taking ownership, uh, being accountable, versus the boss may say, you as a team, you, you failed this organization, it was your fault. Um, a manager will know how it's done. Well, a leader may not necessarily always know how it's done, but they know how to inspire versus a manager. They know the, the, the details of how jobs get done, the tasks that must be accomplished in order to meet a certain goal. Uh, sometimes you can refer to the boss as someone who uses people, although, you know, an organization, that, that's what people are there for, to be used, the, their talents, whatever. So it's not always a bad thing. Uh, a boss may be more likely to take credit because if they are going to uh, have, anyways, some bosses may take the blame. Well, if they take the blame, they also want to take the credit. Some will pass on the blame, but still take the credit. Uh, they're more about commands, and they're the one that says go. All right, start your shift. Let's get going. Let's get the job done. Now, a leader, the, uh, how to differentiate a leader from a boss, again, would be a leader is more concerned about coaching, on the goodwill uh, of the employees and working together. They try to get employees enthusiastic and motivated, and they say, we, we need to accomplish this goal. That's leadership. Uh, fix, there's a misspelling here, but fix the, uh, fix the breakdowns. So let's get together and fix things. Uh, they show how it's done, not necessarily tell someone uh, what to do, but they, they, they show how it can be done, I would argue, that this could be improved, and then work together to figure out how a problem uh, can be accomplished and, and solved. They are concerned about developing people and more willing to give credit when something occurs as well as take the blame, as I stated earlier, and uh, be accountable for when there is a breakdown, when there are problems. They tend to ask versus telling someone and then rather than saying go, they will refer to the whole team and say, let's go. It's, it's a maybe a little bit of a, a play on words but to say go versus, that's more of an instruction, versus let's go, meaning I'm with you. Let's go. <laughs> let's get the job done. All right. So now that we understand a bit more about some of the differences between leadership and management, power versus the leader, power versus influence, let's look at six different leadership styles and some of the characteristics that are consistent with each of these leadership styles. 
a leadership style that personally i almost would refer to this is as non leadership however there according to some and i've i've researched different areas and different you know different resources i should say and found different definitions of what is called laissez faire leadership and there could be some uh, good attributes, some good characteristics of the laissez-faire leader. However, again, I tend to perhaps focus more on the negative side of this leadership style. And that's why sometimes I would refer to it as almost like non-leadership. First off, there's minimal guidance. A team needs guidance. That uh, An organization, a community, they need guidance. That's why they turn to people to be a leader. So therefore, if you are selected as, let's say, a manager of a team, and you have minimal guidance, you step back, well, that can be considered a, a, both a positive and a bad thing. Depending on the type of team or community, some may say, you know, I, I don't want to be bothered. I want to, to do the job. I'm smart. I understand how the job is done. Therefore, minimal guidance can be effective in certain situations. Although one might argue if there is zero guidance, then there is no leadership. So to have minimal guidance, I would argue, is minimal leadership. Uh, it can be empowering or it can be discouraging. So laissez-faire leadership can be empowering because the, the goal is to, as a manager or community leader, is to say you are responsible and do your best. See what you can do. And they, that these type of leaders will empower others to be able to see you know, what they are capable of. You can also consider maybe a parent in a family allowing a child to, to do a task, even if that parent knows the task might be done incorrectly, but they empower that child to get the job done. So that is a form of leadership. But it can also be discouraging. Many people in, in the workplace need guidance. They, many people need to be told what to do. They need that manager that is more uh, assertive. And it can be discouraging if you have a manager that is very hands-off, that does nothing or does little, and it can be seen as more of a, of a negative type of characteristic. I read where they state a laissez-faire leader could be one that takes charge if needed. Now, I wouldn't consider that leadership. I would consider that, again, as we described earlier, management. If you're gonna take charge, well, the, the, by definition, taking charge means telling people what to do and telling people what to do, based on my earlier descriptions, is management, not leadership. So therefore, this idea that a laissez-faire leader will take charge when needed, one might argue that, again, that is not leadership. Uh, lack of structure. Also, not a, not a manager or a leadership trait. When you have a lack of structure, that means less management, less coordination, less uh, instruction, less perhaps even planning, there's that lack of structure. So less management, but also less leadership because there is less involvement, uh, less dialogue, those leadership characteristics. And then finally, accountability. I have to wonder, and I did read where uh, some research will show that a laissez-faire leader will pass the blame if they are going to go ahead and let people do uh, a task or, or a, you know, a job, a, a create a program, whatever it is, if the laissez-faire leader will empower others to do so, well, then those others need to also be accountable. So the laissez-faire leader can say, I, it's not my fault, it is your fault. Um, so accountability is questionable because perhaps a good laissez-faire leader will empower others, but then when problems occur, they will then in turn step up, uh, become accountable for the, the problem, saying I allowed these individuals to do this, therefore it is my fault. Now, later on when we talk about servant leadership, for instance, accountability is a very important part of servant leadership. And I believe at this point, uh, as we get into, right before we get into the next leadership style, it's important to understand, typically a manager or leader is not going to be one of these types of leaders. They, they will have a combination of different leadership styles to varying degrees. So therefore, if one is a laissez-faire leader, if a person is a laissez-faire leader, if they perhaps uh, have 
in addition to these various styles, or some of them, also servant leadership styles, maybe uh, some transformational leadership characteristics, a, a combination of those, perhaps that there are some of these characteristics of a laissez-faire leader uh, may be more acceptable and more effective. So let's continue along. Oh, and one last note I'd like to make. Um, I believe that you can be trained as a laissez-faire leader. I will be discussing in each of these uh, various leadership styles if you can be trained or not, because that's an interesting thing to consider because right at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that anyone can be a leader. Well, if you cannot be trained to be a certain type of leader, uh, then not everyone can be a leader. So a laissez-faire leader, people can be trained to step back, perhaps as a manager, to not be so invasive, not to tell people what to do, but step back and empower others. Uh, that can be trained. So an individual, therefore can be trained with this leadership style. Now the next leadership style we'll discuss is, is authentic leadership. Uh, I use this picture here as an example for the authentic leader because I see some, uh, uh, I love to cook, I love to eat, and I see certain foods as being more authentic than others. Many times foods will have lots of sauces or gravies or, or things that are covering up the, the basic elements of the food, the meat or the vegetable or the fruit or the, the, the fish, whatever it may be, uh, at the base of that food is something that I would call authentic. It is the, the natural ingredient that is the core part of that food. And so the authentic leader is genuine. They're at the core, they're authentic. Uh, the genuine leader you can recognize because they will not necessarily do something to you and then over here when you're not listening do something else okay that's not being authentic their actions are consistent they're genuine what i tell you now is what i do for other people and when you are not listening this is me i'm authentic self-discipline is very important to be an authentic leader because if problems occur at times, people will be uh, will be tempted to do the wrong thing, to not take the blame, to whatever it may be. So self-discipline is important to maintain your principles, your integrity, to maintain your character as an individual, so that way you consistently uh, maintain this this uh, uh, this authentic leadership style. Intrapersonal and interpersonal are two different terms. Intrapersonal would be, I am true to myself. I understand myself. I understand what challenges perhaps I have and how I like to work to address those challenges. So that way I can become a better individual and be more authentic because then the interpersonal is when I'm now authentic with you, with others. So in other words, I must first understand myself. I must understand my behaviors and my characteristics and my, my personal attributes, what makes me mad, what makes me upset, um, my strengths, my limitations. I must understand all those things so I can truly be authentic to you as well. Uh, an authentic leader is also considered uh, perhaps passionate. They have passionate for what they do, they have passion for themselves and for how they are able to contribute. They have passion for what others are able to do. And uh, if they don't have the passion in what they're working on, then arguably they cannot be authentic because they would have to be fake. They would have to act in order to get the job done. For instance, if I'm passionate about teaching, then I can now be authentic. I can be myself. But if I don't like teaching, but I'm still teaching, I have to fake it, and that's not being authentic. I have to pretend to enjoy the, the work that I do. So being passionate is critical for the authentic leader. And then finally, con connectedness. Being connected with individuals is very important in that communication. So that way, uh, others can see who you are. You're connected with them. They can see who you are. They can see you're being authentic. And then you will be much more effective at what you do to influence others because you are uh, connected with them and they can see how authentic you are and people appreciate that. They, they appreciate uh, an individual that one might call real.
In other words, they're, they're, they're real, they're, they're genuine. This also can be developed. Uh, being an authentic leader, the, the concept of being authentic is actually part of servant leadership. So it is not totally a new concept, even though some uh, scholars will say that the concept of being an authentic leader is new. It is actually extremely old, going back thousands of years, that the concept of, of being genuine. Uh, and it definitely can be developed. We'll talk more about that uh, in a little while when we address servant leadership. Now, the transactional leader, uh, you might you might describe uh, these type of behaviors as more of that power oriented to some degree. Um, there is definitely what is called a leader and follower exchange. So in other words, there is an individual that uh, has a job to do, uh, something that needs to get done, and there are followers that are there to do the job. So there needs to be this exchange between the leader and follower. That is a, a critical component of transactional leadership. And along with that relationship between the leader and follower, you have a contract. Now, the contract may not be a written contract. It may be a verbal contract. It may be just an understood contract. So in other words, I come to work for you and your organization. It's understood that there's going to be an exchange of you're perhaps going to pay me, compensate me, provide me with, with resources, with uh, whatever it may be that you are giving me. And in turn, part of this contract is that I provide my services for you. I build trucks, I weld, I'm a plumber, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a firefighter, whatever it is, I am doing my part of this contract and you are doing your part of the contract. That is this transactional approach to leadership. And again, this is more, and I actually listed it here twice um, because I want you to consider this strongly that perhaps the transactional leader is much more of a manager than a leader. And so therefore there are limited benefits to the transactional leader because it is not so much as we described earlier, not so much engagement among the followers, not so much personal uh, growth and interaction. It is more of here is what's done and uh, we need to get the job to done, done, therefore I will tell you what needs to be done and you do the job. There may be some benefits to that transactional leader, particularly if you have situations where uh, a job needs to get done in a hurry, maybe there's a crisis. Uh, it could be such as when we had the pandemic where we needed uh, people that were developing the vaccine that they did not have time perhaps to uh, to be able to really engage certain people in, in, the, in the task. It's you, you need to go and you need to explore these things. Here's what you need to do, you need to do, and you need to do. So there's a component of that process that, that where transactional leadership may be important. But then of course, as I mentioned, combination of the various leadership styles is what can be the most effective. Because while you may tell certain people, all right, here's what we need to be done, you can also add in perhaps this uh, transformational leadership approach, the authentic leadership approach, the laissez-faire approach, where now people are taking control, they're getting engaged, they're empowered, and therefore they'll get the job done more effectively. Now the transformational leader, transformational leadership first off is, has been, become very popular in the last few decades or two decades or so. And uh, uh, the, the, the description of a transformational leader would be connected to the followers, um, perhaps activism. So in other words, something needs to be changed. Uh, there's, there's problems in our community, problems in our workplace, serious issues is many times what the transformational leader, sh leader will be associated with. And therefore, change needs to occur. Uh, the potential of the follower is emphasized. So in other words, uh, you can imagine a transformational leader giving a speech, such as the picture you see here with Martin Luther King Jr., uh, telling the followers that you are the ones that need to make this change happen. Empower the followers, let them know their potential, let them know that they can contribute and cause the change to happen. They can be, of course, very influential and must be very influential. To be a transformational leader, you need to be influential in order to make this dramatic change that needs to occur. 
they also have an ability to articulate goals. Now we must be careful on this because articulating goals could be considered more transactional, could perhaps be considered more of a managerial type task. However, if the goals are properly articulated, then people can understand the larger goal, the long-term thinking, which is also long-term, is more of a, of a characteristic of a leader, short-term manager, long-term leader. Therefore, that leader can articulate what perhaps the ideal community might look like, what perhaps the ideal family would look like, or the workplace, what, what is our long-term goal, and then, then in turn inspire, influence others uh, by articulating this vision which vision is a very much a characteristic of a leader. And so that way those goals are met. Now I would argue that while some of the characteristics of the transformational leader can be developed, I would argue that potentially the leader has to have some sort of position to be transformational. Arguably, if you are, let's say a frontline worker within an organization, it is much more difficult, if not impossible, for you to be a transformational leader unless you have a position. It could be uh, part of a, um, if you don't have a title within your organization, perhaps you are a, a community leader of some sort. Uh, perhaps you're a leader in your church. Perhaps you are uh, a manager. You are a company CEO or on a board of directors uh, in a variety of positions. If you have a position or a title, then you can be the transformational leader. And if you do not, arguably, it is much more difficult, or like I said, maybe even uh, impossible to be a transformational leader. I would also argue you need followers. You need followers to be a transformational leader. And you need followers, uh, perhaps for most any other leadership style. But I do have a theory I'll uh, touch base with you on a moment here where you don't necessarily always need followers to be a leader. That may be the first time you've ever heard of that. You may argue that point to say, no, you must have followers to be a leader, but I will give you an example in a shortly where possibly you don't. Now the charismatic leader is a particular leadership style that also we might argue that it's much more difficult to develop and to some degree, possibly even impossible to develop. And so let's talk about that. If you imagine some of the most charismatic individuals. They are very outgoing. They have an av ability to captivate an audience and people get excited when they're around them and they want their autograph. They want to, whatever it might be, they're very excited. They want to be next to this person. Well, arguably we cannot all do that. I have never considered myself a charismatic individual. I don't believe I can become a charismatic individual because it is perhaps, anyways, to some degree, it is a trait that you are born with. Now, also, of course, you'll argue uh, you're not just born with that. Well, no, I said to some degree. And because uh, being an introvert versus an extrovert, uh, for instance, some of those are stable characteristics that to some degree we're born with. And being charismatic uh, is, is similar. So therefore, much more difficult to develop and maybe even for many people impossible. Uh, charismatic leadership is associated with popularity. So people are just really attracted to the individual and, and whenever they hear the person's name, they get excited, they, they, they want to be next to this person, so popular. It's also associated with public speaking where many charismatic leaders are individuals that attract large crowds. And again, people wanna hear them speak and people will follow them no matter what they say many times. Um, that is why many times charismatic leader leadership is associated with destructive leadership because the charismatic leader uh, can be highly destructive if their charisma is not properly used or not used for, uh, for the better good of the community, which of course that can be twisted. The charismatic leader can say this is for the better good of the community. However, it may be better good for them in certain segments of the community, but not other areas of a community. Uh, charismatic leadership has been associated with manipulation. So in other words, and manipulation, you could say, is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, imagine, for instance, a highly charismatic individual that's a salesperson. Well, one might argue if you're selling a product that you're somewhat manipulating 
the person that's buying that product into buying the product because they could buy it from somewhere else, right? So in other words, you're not um, causing them to buy something they don't need. Maybe they really need it, but you still need to some degree perhaps manipulate them to buy it from you and not someone else. So manipulation could be good. Manipulation could be bad. Uh, making people do things they would not normally do uh, and for bad reasons. Uh, obedience is something associated with the charismatic leader where either the obedience is of the followers is demanded uh, or perhaps the, the followers are just simply obedient because they're so captivated and attracted to that charismatic leader. Charismatic leadership is also oftentimes associated with a certain ideology could be political, could be religious, could be um, some sort of social idea or concept, uh, but a certain ideology is something that, that perhaps the charismatic leader will have, could even be for their organization and how things are done, and so they display that ideology to their followers. And then, of course, they manipulate by showing that that is what they consider the best, people follow, and so on. And of course, yes, they can be very motivating. The charismatic leader can motivate uh, hundreds, millions of individuals by being simply charismatic. And it could very well be, we've seen this through history, where charismatic leaders have caused destruction to occur and, and millions of deaths even to people in nations that have turned the wrong direction because someone was very charismatic and made promises uh, that ultimately led to destruction. So there, that is why sometimes the charismatic leadership style can be also uh, compared to a destructive leadership style. And as I argued, it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to develop. Now, servant leadership, very different from charismatic leadership, where charismatic and charisma is maybe impossible to develop, or at least we'll just say, we'll just agree upon that it can be very difficult. Uh, the servant leader, Anyone can be one, Anyone, and it, it, it can be fairly simple to develop because some of the behaviors, for instance, like honesty, it can be simply a matter of choice that I will now be honest versus choosing when to be honest. Maybe I'm dishonest sometimes. So that is a choice that could occur right now. And by doing so, I now am on the path towards becoming a better servant leader. Followers are put first. So you're honest, you're forgiving, you collaborate with others, you're authentic with others uh, because you care about others and you put others first. Whether that be your family, your community members, the employees at the workplace, you put them first. The, the citizens of your of your nation, if, if the servant leader is, is uh, the, the ruler of a country, let's say. Here is where I'll argue that no followers are needed. So here's an example. Imagine if you have a lot of money and you donate that money to an organization. Let's say you give that money to a, a church or a synagogue and uh, you do not want your name to be known. So you give that money, maybe it's a totally, not even to a person, it's an anonymous letter or something. And so now what you've done is you've improved your community by improving that organization, but no one knows who you are. Well, you are still a leader. You are still improving the community. You are still caring about others. Uh, matter of fact, you are being very humble because you are not taking credit for this donation. Humility is a very important characteristic of the servant leader. So you've taken care of the community. You're humble about that. Um, and you have no followers. No one knows who you are. So I believe this concept is very important to understand, and I've never really read anywhere about this before because most anywhere you would go, they would tell you that followers are needed for the leader. In this example, I believe I've shown where you do not need a follower to be a servant leader. Relationships, however, are very important. And so I'm not contradicting myself. I'm just saying you don't need to have followers to be a leader, but when you do have followers, those relationships are important. So it's important that you develop relationships, you care about others, you are uh, care, you listen carefully, you actively listen and understand people. Uh, 
you are collaborating with individuals, you are empowering people, all of these various characteristics that are associated with putting others first. Uh, there is a spiritual side of servant leadership. One might argue also a religious side to spiritual, uh, to servant leadership. I will emphasize that it doesn't mean you need to belong to a formal religion, but many of the characteristics of the servant leader are consistent with religious principles, such as honesty and forgiveness and so on. And these are universal concepts that uh, globally with maybe small areas that are what you would consider in statistics outliers or something. Uh, but globally, uh, forgiveness is important. So in other words, the way the human being has been created, if we do not forgive internally, we have problems. It increases stress, causes lots of emotional as well as not, not just the psychological but physiological problems. And that is, that is a universal challenge. But when you do forgive, then it can um, lead to positive outcomes universally. So that's why servant leadership also is something that I'm very much a proponent of because of the, the uh, uh, global implications. And the, uh, you might say the global availability, uh, development, I don't even know what words can best describe it, but except other than just what I mentioned to you before, and that is anyone can be a leader and in this case, I highlight anyone can develop themselves to be a servant leader. I'll leave you with this, and that is, again, anyone can be a leader. It is so important for you, for those of you that are uh, watching this presentation, if you do not have any title, perhaps you're not a parent, you, you don't have any position within your community, you are, you are someone that maybe you work or you don't even work. Perhaps you are uh, within your home and you're alone and maybe due to a disability or something, you can be a leader. You can be at your job and you're a frontline worker. You're a, you're a welder. You have no managerial title. You're not a supervisor. You, uh, you have very little contact with, with others. You just do your job. You can be a leader. Um, whoever you are, you definitely can be a leader, particularly in this area of servant leadership where you can make positive contributions to your family, your friends, your community, your fellow coworkers, anybody. So this, with this one lesson alone, if you take that with you, I believe is very important. You can start right now. That is the greatest thing about being a leader. You do not have to wait. You can start right now by making a contribution, by talking to someone that maybe you haven't talked to in a long time and you know that it would help them out by saying something nice to somebody, by forgiving someone that maybe they, they're driving terribly and they, they move in front of you on the road suddenly and, and rather than getting mad at them, you forgive. So these characteristics can apply to, to your life right now and you can start becoming a better leader. Again, my name is Dr. Dan Kohinka. Um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation on the psychology of leadership. We have learned that not just anyone can be a leader, but we've also discussed differences between power and influence, influence being the leader, a manager versus that leader, leader who engages people rather than just tells them what to do. And we discussed various leadership styles. There are, there are many more approaches to leadership. There have been volumes and volumes of books written on leadership, but hopefully this is a good introduction for you to some uh, fairly popular uh, leadership styles and approaches to leadership. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the presentation and I wish you a very happy and blessed day. Thank you.